Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp, your host. I'm going to usher you in into the weekend. It is Halloween weekend, and then, of, of course, you can, as you can tell, I'm dressed up as a morning show host who honestly doesn't care about his appearance. So uh, I guess that counts, but of course, I'm wearing my uh, orange um, spi <laughs> pumpkin spice latte sweater, and I'm here to usher you in, talk about this and that. The city council actually had a special meeting through Committee of the Whole to talk about the uh, authorized campsite in which they talked deeper and deeper into it and also had some of the residents of the authorized campsite talk about that. We'll talk about that with my city council report. We also have a whole bunch of other things happening as well. We got a brand new dub and stuff where I redubbed an old movie and I also have a lot of information um, and we're going to basically go on a rant about this upcoming election like a lot. So before we get started, I just kind of wanted to talk about some of the top headlines coming from AP News right now is uh, Musk is basically in control of Twitter. He uh, had a whole announcement by actually bringing in a sink into the uh, Twitter headquarters and basically said, let that sink in. And, you know, the ultimate dad joke. Well, he has like nine kids, so, you know, he, he has more dad uh, joke energy going for him as well. Um, a lot of other things happening back and forth, so a lot of things. Uh, um, and then, you know, the continuation of uh, pro, uh, just uh, with all the the whole Ukraine conflict has also inspired a lot of other potential conflicts that may or may not happen. There's just a lot of uh, stories going around. I don't want to talk about it too much, but North Korea has fired missiles towards the sea as U.S. warns over nukes. Um, there's also, you know, Taiwan is also another big um, item on ticket. There hasn't happened anything recently since Nancy Pelosi's visit there, but so far there's a lot of like tensions that are growing in that particular area. It's kind of like, it kind of feels like there's like a trend going around. It's like, oh, the whole Ukraine thing is like, oh, why don't we just make our country whole and then invade these places and so I'm just journalizing now so that's just a lot of stuff happening right now and everything like that but you know have you uh, been bombarded with uh, political pamphlets in the mail you know Missoula over the last uh, month or so has been a steady stream of political handbills but you know uh, this year definitely feels a little bit crazy because it seems like every other day I'm getting a, a repeat of the same pamphlet from the same person from the same joker you know asking me to vote for them they have their slogans they have everything that you know they think you want to hear all that stuff but each day I get more and more political ads just not over YouTube but old school the mail you know YouTube you can handle that you can get a VPN everyone always talks about VPN I'm not selling you a VPN but the whole idea is that you basically tell the internet that your computer is actually not in Missoula but somewhere else therefore you can uh, dodge a lot of those ads as long as it's not like Montana so anyways that's a little advice for you guys who, who hate seeing YouTube ads and just regional ads uh, on your internet viewing services. So anyways, over the course of the last two years, from folks claiming the election was stolen to red states overhauling elections, making it harder for same uh, day voter registration and going even so far as arresting folks for illegal voting. So Florida, you probably heard about this in the last couple of weeks, but Florida, Ron DeSantos sent over election police, as it was dubbed in the media as well, to round up some of the folks who were taken into custody uh, over the last month or so, um, only to be let go after their charging. And part of this was uh, one of, many of the skeptics of Ron DeSantis, which, you know, the list keeps on growing. Um, are stating that the election police could be used for political gains. The police also released footage of those arrests with confused citizens and police alike just following the rules. Uh, voter fraud is a high risk, low reward situation in the federal system, but most are ignored in counting when caught and their vote is not counted. Um, voting staff would have to follow up with voters, which is hard because they'd have to get in contact with them before the voting wraps on that same day. So you don't necessarily talk to the police on what is right or wrong when it comes to whether the law is just or not. Their boss, they have bosses like everyone else and they just have to deal with the laws they even might see as unjust themselves, but they are slave to their law enforcement system and they uh, offer little to no rebuttal in public forums. And you know, you can um, see that in a lot of things is, you know, you don't interview a police officer about the law because they just they follow the law and they interpret it best as they can. So moving on, I'm not going to get into too much of that rant because I feel like I'm going in pure rant territory. Voting in Missoula has become a kind of a mess and just a lot of things going here and there. Um, KPEX did a story not so long ago about the public tours of the county election spaces and all the new tech installed to monitor and watch ballots being counted either live or in person or online. Uh, public tours 
have really just taken our transparent process and formalized it, said Bradley Steeman, elect elections administrator for Missoula County. Uh, he also was quoted in saying is, what this leads is to a better understanding of the process and then what they ultimately relates to is confidence in the vote. With multiple cameras at multiple angles, Missoula has modernized our county process within the last couple years. It's quite a surveillance state over there at the election office if you look at it with an emphasis on retaining the privacy of voters and who they voted for. Election day is November 8th, which is usually on par with the uh, um, it's usually the first Tuesday in November that follows a Monday. And, um, you know, and it's getting, you know, we're a mail-in voter town, like for the most part, you know, on the first day the ballots were mailed out, I saw a whole line of cars parked outside the election office, basically handing their ballots. So people already had exactly who they wanted to vote for. And, you know, it's, you know, if you have a voter page and if you want to get registered to vote, it's probably the best time to do it right now. Uh, but if you're planning on actually putting it in the mail to mail it in, it'd probably be better if you see your voter status and see if you can get the ball rolling on this uh, moving forward. But there's some people who, who didn't get mail-in ballots who have to show up for election day, which luckily uh, most of us get the day off, so I'm kind of happy about that personally, even though I already mailed in my ballot and I already did my civic duty. All that stuff. Uh, whenever you have someone complain about the mail-in ballots uh, as unfair or shady at best, remind you that mail-in ballot voting was meant for military service members. So if you don't support mail-in ballots, you don't support the military or the troops. Besides, it's easier than to show up one of these pop-up election offices, which is a nightmare where in some ways you basically are just kind of waiting around and then you get into these tiny claustrophobic booths in which you have to vote for. I don't know. At some point, maybe we'll find a way to modernize and have a protected s service in which we can use electronic services to uh, count all our votes. So that way we don't actually, so we can actually run as a true democracy rather than having a special day to have our special votes casted. So anyways, um, you know, it's, you know, it's just my own personal opinion, first and foremost. See, I'm going on a rant. This is less about news and more about what's kind of happening in, the, in, 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 in our election cycles and everything like that. But hey, you might be wondering, is, like, is there a, a red wave imminent? I mean, that's one of the big questions the media has been kind of throwing around, kind of like telling and everything like that. But in terms of just cold hearted facts, is that every single ele midterm election, the pendulum swings the other way. It always has, always will, and it always has. And the only time um, the party in power has ever retained their uh, power um, through the midterms was like in 1896. And so that it had to be a very interesting year. Like I just read about Grant and uh, Ulysses S. Grant from the Civil War, and he was the uh, first person to hold a two-term office in like 30, 40 years. It was it was ridiculous to kind of go back and forth to kind of see that, you know, even back in those days is that the president elect would always get overturned by the person who has the other party. So it was very uh, natural for that to go back and forth. And so that's kind of how I'm seeing this because it always happens back and forth. So changes on the horizon, but it would be just one old white guy for another old white guy because frankly, the party in power hasn't really flexed enough to, to uh, show any kind of short-term successes to hold it together and have the party skeptic as also not gonna have a plan. So thinking that uh, the next party in power um, is gonna have a, a better plan is laughable at best. So um, anyways, <laughs> even when it comes to hiring practices, the employee is worried about finding adequate staff, but applications tend to be ignored. This is all, I mean, this is a big part of what's happening in our economy, first and foremost, is that, you know, you have your higher wages, we got that big bump, but at the same time, a lot of the people who got the higher wages already left a lot of those jobs, so their employers had to end up getting um, uh, adequate staff to run their operations. So, and, and then the staff, you know, like because of small businesses, they're like, oh, we have to compete. We have to have like 13, 45 an hour or 15 an hour, but then they're un unable to hire two or three more people to be on staff. So then that way you have less of a workforce doing twice the amount of work for better pay, but it's still not the same kind of work they would have gotten pre-pandemic kind of era stuff. And of course, I spoke to a friend about finding a job in 2018 before the pandemic, 20 paces ignored or flat out throughout the application. Even during the pandemic, the essential workers got it hard. And I meant as like essential workers as those who stock your shelves only to get sick and um, serve food. But uh, like, it's, it's interesting because a lot of them had to do double duty. And if they did get sick, a lot of businesses in town just flat out just closed due to inadequate staffing. And of course, those days didn't change. Small businesses that could not afford higher wages lost employees that built up and new employees, they are sent 
into the fire to try to keep up with their predecessors. So that's why there's been such a wide uh, revolving door in some of the businesses that I frequent. So I try to support local businesses, but this may actually seem like isolated incidents, but this is this is just like a pieces, pieces of the puzzle that are all kind of coming together in terms of just transportation and truckers. That's the big thing. It's all about the means, the, the blood flow of our economy is trade, import, exports, and all that stuff. There's a lot of towns that don't actually manufacture or build anything anymore. And transportation, trucks, and railroad workers on the verge of collapse, collapse because they are also uh, dealing with the fact that they're working with pandemic level of workforces where there's less workers doing the same job for roughly the same pay. They might have gotten a bump for raises for sticking with it, that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, for those who lost their jobs, they didn't necessarily be able to get back a return altogether. It's not about the great assessment, but some um, jobs just don't exist anymore. Have you ever heard that before where you're working at a job and they're just like, oh, they weren't fired. No, 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 they didn't quit. No, their job just doesn't exist anymore. That seems to be like an easy way of not dealing with any of that stuff. So how many times have you heard someone losing their jobs because their position no longer exists? I've heard it like four or five different times, but it gets to the point where that you, you won't be fired from your job, just a weird gaslight-esque uh, removal of said job. Railroad workers are on the verge of strike with little to no support from their bosses, l uh, less staff, and their expe uh, expectation that rails will keep running the same way before the pandemic with the uh, pandemic staffing levels. Uh, truckers have also had a major sh uh, staffing issues because the means of transportation have been hit. You have Amazon fulfilling orders at record numbers and means of exports are ramped up. NPR did a story back in 2021 for the need of an additional 80,000 truckers and the additional 180,000 truckers uh, by 2018. So at this point, the economy is in complete top heavy and these strikes are more about creating a comfortable workspace with better wages to combat all those shortages that are being held together by small groups of workers whose employees are expecting the same amount of productivity at half the staff in some cases. There are many of these trends that are happening. It's not only about uh, filling in the gaps, they're working with a broken infrastructure from the bottom, supporting the top and holding the rest of us hostage as we're trying to get that same day delivery from our Amazon. Uh, you, know, you know, to think your local representative is going to go bat for you and help you with any of this stuff is insane. Pick a lane because we're getting less uh, training requirements for truckers every day. And another NPR story, yes, um, I, I, I do frequent NPR, but one of the big stories that always catches my eyes are these kind of insane things that where people either have to uh, uh, scrip and save to pay the medical bills for things that they got to pay for, for weird medical, uh, just going into a room, they had to pay an additional $10,000 for an additional waiting room. But then you got uh, these young kids who are in these trainings to be truckers driving gasoline trucks. And so, when you're driving petroleum and driving around, you're basically driving with flammable material. So one of the uh, prerequisites is that you have to have a couple years of actual experience to drive these truckers. And then this story that I heard on NPR is like, right out of training, boom, he's delivering gas to all these uh, gas stations, everything like that. So it's, it's, it's just insane just how the system is kind of like starting to kind of crumble in those ways in which there's a lot of easy fixes for it. And, but at the same time, it's um, making it even more complicated by, your top heavy of government. So there's all my rants, there's all this stuff. And so basically I have a reward for you guys. Um, at the end of my rant is a fun series of videos for the kids to enjoy. Uh, this is our part of our Saturday drop-ins. Um, Saturday drop-ins every Saturday, one to 3 p.m. for kids aged uh, eight to 14. And we also have a brand new uh, winter days camp for kids during the winter break, the dog days of winter, um, <laughs> if that's even a saying, but from um, uh, December 28th through December 30th, uh, your kid gets to enjoy a three-day camp during the winter break, uh, uh, right after uh, um, Christmas, but before uh, New Year's. And without further ado, here are some of those videos that the kids made last Saturday and uh, the promo.
Winters are getting cold out there in Missoula, and MCAT is doing Winter Days Camp. For three days, kids get a chance to make their imagination come to life in a series of hands-on learning from stop animation, filmmaking, and more. We have cameras, computers, and various Legos, and props to enhance their videos. Create, share, and repeat in this three-day workshop where kids collaborate and work on some of their own projects. Winter Days Camp at MCAT inside the award-winning Missoula Public Library. Sign up now at MCAT.org. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. We have a short amount of movies. There's just not that uh, many uh, uh, happening, but uh, for without further ado, here is Pre-Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but maybe the title and a little bit of the synopsis. But I've seen some ads for this movie, but it's Pray for the Devil. But it's not like Prey. It's more like Prey as in, you know, Predator and Prey. Anyways, it's a planned word. It's fun. Who cares? Yeah, yeah another possession movie that will uh, be forgotten in now. Uh, so <laughs> he had an attempt to bring the Bible more and more into our lives. It follows a nun who is performing an exorcism, but she's like the Harry Potter of exorcists forced into a classroom of uh, priest men, and she's the only woman there to perform exorcist because this is a man's job. And it's like, oh, I'm a woman. I'm going to be able to do this better than you. And she does. Pray for the devil. That's the movie that's coming out. So anyways, uh, um, the whole, I guess, her gift of being able to help people with possession also has a back story as well. That she blah blah blah, and in their history, it was she was born this way, just like Lady Gaga. I'm not saying that Lady Gaga's possessed. Uh, Call Jane. This one is also for the ladies, as they get stuff done. You hear that, Gaia. Um, watch as these women create an underground railroad for abortion care in this based on a true story type of film that helps women get a path to abortion and there's probably some guy who's like you don't have control of your bodies and they're like get out of here and then he's like you be me this time I never saw it that way and then there's a black screen with white letters and then you have the old-timey photo of the people the real people behind the story anyways that's your movie um, then you got the layer uh, not to be confused with liar liar the eye is placed somewhere differently. Anyways, enjoy a horror film about a monster and some college, oh actually college age actors um, playing some young kids on vacation, but it's actually about a fighter pilot in Afghanistan who gets shot down by the terrorists and then she gets terrorized by a monster inside the cave and uh, she thought she had to deal with an oppressive Taliban and now she has to contend with a monster lurking in some of those caves. Apparently these are half human, half aliens and all cop. Uh, Alright, so anyways, um, yeah. Those are some of the movies that are to come out this week, and I have a movie for you guys as well before I jump into my uh, long um, city council meeting. So without further ado, here is Dublin Stuff from the movie Unknown World from 1951. Last time we saw our heroes, they were drilling for gold. Will they find it? Find out now. <coughs> oh, another large cavern. I think we should turn back. Look, there's some running water. Let's run towards it! Watch your helmets, folks! Oh yeah, not this joker again. I don't need safety! Hmm... Ah... Ah, so this is where Boba T comes from. Well... We just gonna stand here or something? Yeah, what's going on here? Hmm? Okay, gang, let's get some. With this amount of Boba, we'll never go thirsty again! Huh, <laughs> don't get your hopes up, you'll probably get diabetes. Have you read the label? Come with me! We're going to go check out this label. Let's run over stop here. Running in the cave. See? Mm-hmm. Here. Let me take a listen. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, more boba tea. Now we can open those crappy food carts and serve this. <laughs> Boba's not healthier than, like, soda or whatever. It has, like, twice the amount of Why sugar. Why do we bring him along? He's a real buzzkill. You don't understand. With this amount of boba tea, we will start an institution. Change the game. I'm just living the boba tea lifestyle. Boba tea, baby. Man, I could really use a boba right now. Hello, guys. Hey, did you guys find any uh, boba tea or whatever? Well, it's funny you should mention it. It's in the rocks. We could hear it in the rocks. It's right there in the rocks. <laughs> well, move aside and call me Zoolander because I'm about to be hired by Mugatu. Uh, I think it's pronounced Mugato. <laughs> Listen, I'm the one with the hammer, so just back off. All right. <clears throat> Come on, Boba T. I gotta take my helmet off for this one and my shirt for the ladies. Hey, it's been two weeks since you looked at me. Thirteen days to get it and to say I'm sorry, but yesterday I uh, was missing you and I. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, anyways, Here, let's let get me this help going. You. 
Hey, quit taking off your shirt, too. Two is better than one. <laughs> just look at the two of us. Couple of cards, just hammering away at the mountain and whatnot. I hope. Oh, oh, jeez. I knew this was a bad I, idea. I spoke too soon. Ooh, Let's get out of here. I'll give you my single <laughs> for the guys? bare naked lady, so you can actually learn the song what for me. What are you guys beta. talking it's about? It's one week since I looked at you. I was just trying to make a sequel. Stop. You know, sometimes when I'm watching uh, my dub and stuff videos, I'm just like, darn, I should have said boba gas. And it's like, you need to get the boba tea in the most refined form before you can ingest it. But darn, that, that basically wrote itself. Anyways, let's jump right into some city council. So last Monday meeting did not fall on deaf ears and the city moved to extend the life of the, uh, well, um, they, they plan, they want to, they're looking for the money to move it to the authorized campsite until May 21st, 2023. The city spoke about it on Wednesday, but before the zero traffic death initiative is being put into place for the city of Missoula has been recommended by the transportation staff to help reduce traffic deaths and serious injuries for people who choose any form of transportation in Missoula. So that was amongst the consent agenda which they passed moving forward. Uh, one of the big things also I wanted to mention is that if this is May Nan Ellingson week, and she is probably one of the most important people that are still living uh, that helped draft the uh, Montana State Constitution back in 1972. So uh, Jordan Hess talks a little bit more about the introduction and gives the proclamation for uh, Maynan uh, Ellingson Week. Um, whereas at age 24, Maynan Robinson Ellingson was the youngest delegate to Montana's Constitutional Convention and was voted one of the top or one of the 10 outstanding delegates by those with whom she served. And whereas she was co-author of the uplifting and poetic preamble to the widely admired Bill of Rights that has for 50 years guaranteed equal rights for all Montanans. And whereas as an attorney for the Missoula City Council, she helped shepherd groundbreaking projects whose lasting impact has been acres of open space, riverfront trails and mountain trail easements. And whereas her work nationally as a, as a nationally respected bond council made essential projects in cities and towns across Montana possible by writing the law that gave jurisdictions the ability to borrow money from the state at low interest rates. And whereas her wide ranging phil philanthropic work, including leadership in raising funds for myriad projects, most notably the magnificent Missoula Public Library and the Missoula Art Museum have made Missoula a more attractive, vibrant and appealing community. Now, therefore, I, Jordan Hess, mayor of the city of Missoula in the state of Montana, in the year of the 50th anniversary of the ratification of Montana's Constitution, hereby recognize the week of October 24th through 28th, 2022, as May Nan Ellingson Week. And um, it, I, um, I want to first of all say that um, it is such an honor to read this proclamation. I have, um, I just swore my, fo my fourth oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the state of Montana, and um, it gives me a chill in my spine. Every time I do that, and every time I think about that document, um, because it is such um, the process by which it was crafted and adopted um, is um, really an embodiment of, of um, the best version of ourselves in Montana. All right. So basically, if you're wondering what the whole Montana State Constitution is all about, imagine a group of people in a state come together, um, basically banish the politicians so they can come up with a constitution. And it's one of the constitutions that had been very lowly amended for the last 50 years. I believe they even said during one of their uh, public meetings, they've done a whole bunch of panels and discussions and talks, which are available on MCAT as well as uh, uh, our state constitution has maybe been amended three times over the last course of the 50 years, which is very crazy because look at the uh, um, the U.S. Constitution. It's been amended and updated uh, constantly. So just think about that kind of stuff moving forward. So it's always nice to see some go folks getting in the bump in the terms of history and how much they impact, um, you know, not only about national stuff, but it's, it's always nice to get a little bit local. And I always wanted and I wanted to mention this as well, because these are the kind of like the fluff kind of stuff that people kind of like overlook as something that's pretty uh, important. So a um, friend of Maynan, uh, Carol Van Volkenberg, a retired journalism professor uh, from the University of Montana, and also big journalists uh, working, uh, been working in journalism for many, 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 many years. And so here's Carol Van Volkenberg talking about Maynan Ellington. 
we first met almost 45 years ago when I was a reporter for the Missoulian and she was uh, the attorney for the city council. And that's a long and interesting different story. Uh, but uh, the remarks that she asked me to deliver today are these. Dear Mayor Hess and City Council members, thank you for this honor, and it is truly an honor. And thanks to my friends who have made the effort to give me this recognition. It is a privilege for me. The City of Missoula has been so very good to me over the last 44 years. It all began in 1977 when I came to work in the city attorney's office shortly after graduation from law school. With a diverse, bipartisan, forward-thinking think city council and two wonderful mayors, Bill Craig and John Toole, the city of Missoula made leaps forward in beautifying and revitalizing our community in the six years I worked for the city. Most notable, in my opinion, and with considerable opposition, initially from the business community and a couple of lawsuits, the city council successfully passed a sign ordinance, a landscaping ordinance and a parking ordinance that Dan Lambros acknowledged a while ago were instrumental in making Missoula a better place to live and to attract business. Okay, and so that was uh, Kara Van Volkenberg uh, speaking on behalf of Manning and Ellington. So, Moving on, um, as we uh, talk a little bit more about what's happening in Missoula, you know, some more fluff uh, as well. Um, Heidi West spoke about the Westside Park next to Lowell School, which is um, part of Missoula Parks and Rec and also part of the MCPS School District. They have a kind of a shared uh, playground kind of deal happening over there. And so here's Heidi West uh, speaking about the uh, basically the unveiling the grand opening of this new playground for all those kids at Lions Park. I would just like to invite everyone to the West Side Park Grand Opening um, this Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. It's been a couple of years in the making, and I'm really excited that it's um, open to the public. We're still waiting for one giant piece of equipment um, to get installed, but in the meantime, it's uh, it's worth celebrating. So. Uh, the grand opening event is on Saturday from 4 to 6. We have some food trucks. Uh, we have the Hellgate band making cotton candy. And we have Coach Shane DJing a hopefully costume dance party on um, that wonderful new rubber surfacing. So I hope to see all of you there in costume dancing. Okay. Sorry, I misspoke. It was Westside Park. Uh, I said Lions Park. Uh, sorry. Okay. So uh, that was kind of uh, what was happening happening with the city council meeting. They didn't talk too much about the uh, authorized uh, campsite, but now we're talking about the authorized campsite. And this is through a committee of the whole, which actually ran about 20, 30 minutes longer than the meeting was supposed to. And so this was a, a, a debate, a presentation was brought up by Daniel Carlino talking about uh, some of the statistics and some of the money that would go um, for more of a... Uh, uh, a, a different way of approaching this system rather than having security forces there. Um, um, so this is what he had to say. So here are some of the costs. Um, we've got the current model and the partnership based model um, from um, city staff. And, you know, with the current model, we're the majority of the money is obviously going towards security every month. Um, and then there's those staffing costs for um, the two full-time employee uh, coordinator positions and the one-time full-time employee or one full-time employee um, specialist supervisor. And then also the site costs of trash, water, bathrooms, et cetera. Um, and then the proposed partnership model does not have any additional security costs because it's included in the roaming support from Black Knight. Um, and then also, but this would have this looks at the staffing costs of having nine full-time employees and two extra full-time employees for specialist supervisors. And, you know, we've never had that many employees at the authorized campsite, and it certainly has been able to run with less. Um, but if we had the ideal partnership-based model here, this is how many employees we would have and how much that would cost per month. But I definitely think that we could continue to run it without having 11 full-time employees, but this would be ideal. 
Okay. And so, you know, as you see the statistics, you know, it's, he made a clear point, an idea just to kind of throw it out there. Just, uh, and he, you know, Dan Carlino has been known to be very critical of the um, security forces used to uh, protect these shelters and also some of the uh, areas around the POV and also the Johnson Street warming shelter. And for the remainder of the meeting, this meeting was struggling to find a solution that fits in with the um, um, Aaron Peehan's uh, housing and community development recommendation and eventually uh, essentially fell flat on funding um, funds and not um, not only keep the AC ASC open, but the future of the winter shelter would be facing financial issues after this session when the uh, 700,000 of the 900,000 ARPA funds will be wrapped. Um, part of the funding left on the floor is a backup to at least open some of these sites during the winter time after the season, even through the money out of the ARPA is being a go for broke approach in finding more permanent housing during this winter season. So Erin Pian, Housing and Community Planning, spoke, spoke about Daniel's proposal and some of the challenges she and staff have. The reality is, is this site cannot be the long-term home of the authorized campsite. So we feel that investing upwards of a quarter of a million dollars into that infrastructure um, is, not, is not the right investment of taxpayer dollars. This map displays the portion of the site that currently lies within the designated floodplain. Generally, properties within the floodplain have either limitations or outright restrictions on new development. The camp as it exists today lies outside of the floodplain you'll see. It's on the eastern portion of the site that is not shaded blue on that map. Okay, and so you can see just a lot of the uh, presentation that uh, Aaron Pian made about some of the sites with the pictures and uh, other stuff like that. Um, let's see. Um, Bare minimum staffing requirement require that nine service providers must have its two staff members present 24 seven within the best interest of the site. The barriers on staffing and the inability to offer warm amenities and electricity. So too expensive to staff and the site not being feasible for folks um, to live. So anyway, Daniel Colino pleads with the city to use some spaces we've invested in to house and shelter folks. So it's not only about this uh, ASC, but also potentially other sites as well to help some of these folks. We as the government have land and buildings and yeah, not saying that the Y is the best option. I'm just saying that there's places where we have land in a building. And if we don't provide something, then these people are going to be displaced. So I guess I'm just trying to work with you all. I've got a recommended motion to keep the ACS open. That's the easiest thing to not displace people. Um, but I'm just trying to brainstorm with you all to come up with solutions, not to come up with excuses. And, you know, part of that uh, motivation behind that is that uh, a big chunk of the people uh, being uh, moved over to the uh, Johnson Winter Shelter is basically going to be stuffed with uh, any more than 100 up to 155 people potentially in the winter warming shelter as they open it up basically this weekend. Um, remind you that many folks were taken aback when they first heard about the closure and many of these issues don't affect the folks who have said they prefer the site over being forced to move yet again. So Aaron Pian comes back to comment on operate, Operation Shelter Intent and this is what she had to say. All of these services were intended to be temporary and transitional to connect someone to um, to a program that has more of a direct line to permanent housing, right? That is the ultimate goal. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of question about um, whether or not this was intended to be temporary when we opened it. So as opposed to folks staying there temporarily, the service itself was intended to be permanent. Um, and, and it wasn't, but um, I, I understand that that's, that's not a message that some folks heard and, and, um, and that's fair as well. But I, I can say that the city serving as an operational lead on that, um, something we entered into with extreme hesitation, that was always intended to be temporary. We we don't have, um, nor, nor will we have the programmatic expertise, the on the ground experience that is required to run programs like this well. And so, um, so to extend it and to create more of a sustainable long-term program, we absolutely need an operational partner involved. Okay. And so, you know, just think about it like this, um, liability, you know, you have your private property, somebody gets hurt or somebody, uh, hurts somebody else on your private property. 
it, you're you essentially, you know, there's some liability that can fall upon this site as well. So if the city were to keep the site going, very, very minimum to no security or anything like that, the liability just gets higher and higher. But these shelters and spaces are not meant to be permanent and meant to get people services needed to get out of their current situation. But at the same time, a lot of these folks who are going to be speaking um, in these next couple of quotes that I have, a lot of their big concerns is that they can't go through the system that has uh, perpetually failed them again and again and again and in a way they want to be able to have the concept of space. One of the biggest things that was one of the bigger arguments during the uh, back and forth with city council is that Christian Jordan was talking about space and she's a city council member and she mentioned that as well is that people need their own space but when it comes to a lot of these shelter places you have a limited amount of stuff that you can have but you have to take it all out as soon as you bring it in. So there's no form of like putting down roots or anything like that for a lot of people who are in transition. So there's a lot of weird kind of like saying is like, okay, um, you know, even like the institution of homelessness in Missoula has completely and utterly changed over the last couple of years because of the warming shelter. Because back in the day it was just the POV and then the pandemic hit and then the split POV was basically split in half and there's like, okay, now we got to figure out Johnson Street. So they invested more money in Johnson Street. They're able to get that ARPA money to expand upon this uh, homeless network of, of, of services that helps a lot of these people with the temporary safe outdoor space. But at the same time, like the city of Missoula, even before the winter shelter, they had no idea. They were in a lot of ways uh, desire because they didn't know a lot of this, um, a lot of these problems, even though that there were a lot of people harping on the idea that, okay, we need to have uh, more of a, a, a shelter for folks so they don't freeze to death during the winter, which makes a lot of sense. So that uh, throughout many outpouring a cry of uh, community members, they have this moving forward. So as uh, I transition, we're going to talk about, uh, this is Heather Hayes. She is a resident of ASC, and she called out Aaron Pian during the public comment portion of this meeting. This time, I am near furious hearing the lies that have been told you about the things that have been done at our site and the way things have been handled there. That woman was not even seen on site until the meeting when we were told we were closing. We didn't even know who she was. Never seen her face before. That's that's really trying to connect with us, right? And provide us with, with, with the assistance we need. That's showing that her whole organization is behind her and, and trying to provide that for us. Bull. There has been such a lack of that. Almost every word in that presentation she just showed you, besides the financial stuff, which I don't know where she got those numbers from, was bull. These are things that are not true. We have people that have generators that share that power between between a lot of residents so that we do have the ability to have heat. We have heaters. We share all our resources that we all have because we're a community. We're a family in there. Okay, we take care of each other. And I, it, the cost of it all is not necessary, you guys. I, I've been doing so much research about other places and other states that have done this. And they've done it right, and they've done it well. And they've done it from within. Some some of these places leave from within with no security staff present at all. And they do it successfully. They're still successful with these. And they're not a blight on the city. The city is with them. And all agree that the places can stay open and, and are run right. They meet every health and, and, and you know, health code that the city poses on them. They meet it and pass it. And that's them, the residents doing it themselves. The fact that she thinks that we need such an aggressive presence on the ground there. We are all adults. We all came from a point in our lives where we were, we were people just like you. We had jobs just like you. And one bad situation in our lives puts us in this situation. And all of a sudden we need to be managed by a security team. It's, it's making us out to be animals in that place. And we're not. We're just people in hard times. All right, that was Heather Hayes. Um, and here is another quote from another uh, person as well. This person is a resident of Missoula. Uh, ta um, uh, Taylor McDermott, a Missoula resident, spoke about the topic in the city creating their own problems. Just because you pull the site, these people are not going to disappear. You have to do something. I wish for your sake but mostly the residents sake that you would specifically set out to solve those specific problems then rather than coming up with them now as excuses there are more people living at the facility than you acknowledge there are more people there how do i know 
I've been there. Y'all been there? I'm wondering how many of y'all have been there. Do you understand that the ACS residents will not poof into thin air when you pull the camp, leaving people outside with no intervention on your part beyond this camp closure will leave them without heat, sanitation, and water, the very problems you have posed as the problem to keep this camp open. Get over it, figure it out. All right, there you go. Um, and then we also have another resident as well, and this actually comes from a, a resident who also is suffering from addiction and uh, talks about some of the barriers that uh, the, uh, um, the, the system in place has uh, been to prevent her to uh, be able to um, get the help that she needs. So this is, uh, hold on a second, uh, this is uh, Kathy uh, Glubber, and this is what she had to say. TSOS is not going to work for everybody. Because for one, um, I'm an addict, okay? Um, I don't really want to let you say that, but I, I am. I'm an addict. And uh, they are going to be doing random drug testing and alcohol testing over there. And if we fail, then we, it, it, it's really risky that we can be kicked out. And then we're right back on the streets again. Um, some of us, we have animals. Dogs bark. Cats meow. You know, things along that line. And some of them can be very loud. Um, so TSOS is not, or TSOS, however you want to pronounce it, is not for everybody. Um, I would much rather go out in the woods than to go to TSOS. Because, like I said, I am an addict. I struggle with my addiction. Um, I struggle to try to stay clean. And... It's just not something that's feasible for me on, on an ongoing basis to go to TSOS. I would rather stay at ACS, um, that type of stuff. Thank yeah. you. Okay. And so that was uh, pretty much the last of the comments of some of the uh, r residents. There are a lot more of the comments there. You can check that out as well if you go to the Committee of the Whole Meeting on the website. Christian Jordan, City Council, spoke about finding funding for police and not the uh, authorized um, campsite. So this is what she had to say. We have money somewhere. We have money that we can help these folks not get displaced. And I, and I really, again, want to repeat, we are kicking the can down the block. If we don't keep these folks housed, we are going to see it in our tax dollars with more jail, um, with, with, without the jail diversion that it's offering. We're going to see more um, people going to the emergency room. Um, all of our beautiful teams, our hot team, the partnership health team, the uh, mobile crisis team are going to have a heck of a time staying in touch with these clients, which means that they're going to have medicinal decompensation because they're going to run out of their meds for those who are on meds. This is a short-sighted decision that we're making that's affecting our most vulnerable population that is ultimately going to cost us more as taxpayers if we don't find a solution. And we were willing to find a solution for the police the last minute with $45,000. I don't understand this, folks. I, am, I, I beg my colleagues to at least at least table this motion. We've had so many amazing conversations now that we've brought people in from the ACS to, to offer solutions. And I am incredibly moved by all of the ideas that the residents from the ACS have and all of the frontline service providers, the ideas that they have that we've not fleshed out. All right. And so that was Christian Jordan from City Council talking about that. And so, you know, uh, there's not much to say in the end, but part of the uh, pitfalls of creating a new budget amendment has everything to, uh, going against it. Time in which, you know, even the people at the uh, authorized campsite have, were given very little to no time. I mean, sure, you know, it's uh, the city's property and they can do whatever they want. But how the city covered winter shelters in the past was very figure it out as they go. And this is just one of the many things that the city and those go, who go along with with their plans have acted and reacted to the needs of the community. So in the end, the city can't, can't, could not come up with a solution and they just kicked the can down the road for another week. Uh, and they're gonna be talking about it again um, this coming Wednesday. So we'll 
talk a little bit more about it as it goes along. So you can find out more information about this and more by going to the city's website at ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website for those of you looking for anything, permits, uh, get involved with the board, get involved with politics. You can click on the meetings tab, which is like the second from the left. Click on here and it'll bring you to another page. You just scroll down a little bit and you bring up to a calendar. I almost prefer the calendar view because you can look at uh, the date in which you want to watch a meeting and the meeting I got it was from right here. If you can see it closer, uh, yeah, committee of the whole, just right then and there. Yeah, of course, you know, if you're looking at the screen, you're probably like squinting, but regardless of that, it's there, trust me. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much it for my city council. There's a lot going on, and um, I'm going to jump right into some of the Halloween festivities that are happening all weekend long. Let's get right on it. So library kicks off the festivities this morning, uh, which is a celebrate bat week with story time. Story time is for children's three and older uh, and for their and their caregivers. Join us Friday and Saturday at 10.30 a.m. for stories in front of the art box on level two. Story time will be recorded and posted online later. Uh, MCAT will be recording it and it will be on the YouTube channel. This week we'll be celebrating bat week with the a special story time. So uh, last story time they did a uh, kind of a horror thing and now they're going to do some more kind of horror things as well. So yeah, you guys can enjoy that. Hands-on science, spooky science. Spectrum Discovery Center is guided science activities for the Discovery Bench from 2 to 6, Tuesday through Saturday. This week they are learning about spooky science. No registration required. The Spectrum Discovery Center is open for visitors of all ages to explore through engaging exhibits and activities and activities. Anyways, we also have a spooky Missoula market starting at 5 p.m. Friday. Pearl Boba Tea and Missoula Makers Collective. This is at 420 North uh, Higgins Avenue. The Missoula Makers Market is a thoughtfully curated market of local handmade artists, hosts, um, hosted uh, during the summer and the winter. This market seeks to showcase existing emerging talent in the Missoula area in order to create visibly uh, around makers and handmade products. They believe that the entire community benefits when you shop handmade and they're increasing access to handmade products. Come down the shop, enjoy boba tea and all sorts of other stuff that they're selling. If you want to, of course, it's up to you. This is, uh, this is the, the continuation of a market as the uh, uh, Saturday markets are starting to kind of slow down. And so here's something that's not so spooky, but still you have a little bit of fun time at the uh, University of Montana. This is the Planetarium Show. So uh, this is Explore the Mysteries of the Universe with Ali, uh, Ailey Robinson. Shows at 5.30 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. The show is also available on November 11th and November 18th. And so this is their 5.30 and 6.30 show, Mysteries of the Universe at the University of Montana. Rocky Horror Picture Show. Back to some of the horror, but let more about uh, Broadway show tune kind of stuff. Rocky Horror Picture Show, is not, it's not the picture show, but it's the live performance at the Wilma Theater. They're having a 7 p.m. show at the Wilma, but then they have the Late Late Show at 11.45 p.m. too. So if you don't know what the um, uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show is about, um, yes, you're right. Eve, I've seen it, and I still don't get it. The Addams Family, um, a nice goth musical continuing throughout this weekend, and matinees uh, tonight at 7.30 p.m., matinees at 2 p.m., and then Sunday early show at 7.30 p.m., at MCT. Go to mctinc.org for more information. Montana Goth Ball. Uh, the Montana Goth Ball is back. Released the Bats uh, Friday at the Zach. DJs Ginger Bat and Sister Midnight will bring you the spookiest tunes to the live performances by Negative Gain recorded artists. Uh, doors open around 7. Show starts at 8. You can dance, have fun, stuff like that. Gothic, leather, fetish, punk, Victorian, latex and lace. Um, basically, when in doubt, wear black. And that's basically what's happening in your Friday night as we're getting our up. And this is like the kind of like the Super Bowl of like Halloween parties and stuff like that as we jump right into Saturdays. You get your Saturday markets and stuff. You want to go to the farmer's market, do that kind of stuff. That's pretty much one of the last weekends before they start evolving more into the winter market, in which I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the farmer's market, as it sees, is like the biggest market. And, you know, it's the last weekend. It's a Halloween weekend. And I don't know if too many people are too interested in it but it, there's still some people who hold out into the bitter ends for sure. Uh, you and your child, Halloween cupcake uh, decorating. This is part of the Lifelong Learning Center. This is starting at 10 a.m. Uh, would you and your child like to learn how to decorate Halloween cupcakes? Uh, class fee is $39. Uh, so then uh, this is a hands-on class. Where we'll get you and your child decorating cupcakes together. In addition to basic decorating skills, you'll learn how to color icing, load and prepare decorating bags, and more. Working together will be fun and rewarding. And this is a, 
you and your child. Fun times starting at 10 a.m. Boo Bash starting at 10 a.m. at the uh, Pinspiration Missoula, which is at 3075 North Reserve Street, Suite A. The Boo Bash is a uh, Pinspiration Missoula is the first annual mm -hmm. during the fun two hour party your ghouls and goblins will enjoy some spooky themed halloween crafts as missoula's premier do-it-yourself pinterest inspired studio will offer a relaxed no pressure studio where you can create an experience life with your favorite people they love their artists and they tap into the creativity and make their project their own all guests must have a reservation and sign a waiver which can be found on the email confirmation online you can register online through missoulaevents.net um story time celebrate bat week um like i said they they're doing it uh today at 10 30 but if you missed it you can jump on saturday at 10 30 a.m as well so halloween dodgeball tournament saturday at the life uh, city life gym which is just off brooks kind of near uh, the montana club um October 29th at 1 p.m. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge your way to victory. Or just for fun, prizes for first and second place and the team voted best dressed. Um, they'll get done with uh, plenty of time for your scheduled Halloween weekend activities. Limited for the first 10 teams who will register at IML, uh, IM leagues.com slash Missoula. You can contact Anna with questions and you know you just basically can go to also missoulaevents.net to find this and register as well. So first place is a hundred dollar gift card to the Montana Club. <laughs> no, not, no surprise there but second prize is a gift card to a local restaurant to be announced. Best dress is a gift card to a local uh, restaurant as well. So first, second place and yeah so basically the top two teams who will be fighting against each other win anyway so you know there you go. Uh, Saturday drop-in, so MCAT is not doing any kind of spooky theme for Saturday, but we are doing a special thing here at the library on Sunday uh, in conjunction with the libraries um, at the library Halloween. We'll have some candy and some fun stuff with that as well, but we have our regular Saturday drop-ins, one to three for kids to wanting to do stop animation and more. All right, seasonal preservatives, a sauerkraut party at the community barn at Garden City Harvest. Make sauerkraut in both a simple and fun, especially when done in the community. Join Claire uh, Vidrigalbi, uh, Richard, Gr oh, sorry if I totally butcher that name, but on the farm to learn these ancient food crafts and celebrate the closure of a yet another full, bountiful growing season. Maker Space is making 3D spooky 3D printed uh, with cookies. Um, interesting, spooky 3D printing with cookies. I wonder if they're printing 3D cookies. I really doubt it, but I'm pretty sure they do. Elementary age kids will learn about 3D printing while manually 3D printing their own spooky frosting designs on top of cookies. Oh, maybe it is 3D printed cookies. Cool. Um, children must be accompanied by a responsible adult. Space is limited and registration is required. You can register at the Missoula Public Library's website, missoulapubliclibrary.org. Uh, Rocky Horror Show is also happening Saturday night, so if you miss it tonight, this is also happening um, Saturday night. Um, 7 p.m. and 11.45 p.m. show as well at the Woman Theater. Um, Free Cycles is also doing an Enchanted Forest romp. Join for a night of wonderment and enchantment at all ages. Dance party, the Enchanted Forest romp. Come dress as your favorite super uh, forest creature or an enchanted character. Live music, family dancing, and turning the wheel movement games from 7 to 8 p.m. Alcohol free DJ set from 8 to 10 p.m. Interactive art throughout. $5 admission for kids, 12 and under, and $15 for adults. It is their Halloween party. So uh, Halloween night orienteering at the University of Montana. This is uh, basically wayfinding and orienting is the spot of navigating course to the train with a map and a compass. And so they're doing a Halloween themed one at the university at 7 p.m. It's going to be at 32 Campus Drive. Uh, Halloween tango dance and beginners class at the Elks Lodge. They're bringing that back it looks like. Um, so tango class is a great way to uh, break the ice and do some dancing and do some tango and stuff like that. They've been doing this for God forever. It feels like it feels like 20 years and I haven't seen this recently but it's nice to see this again so bodega hallows eve party so bodega's bar is advertising a halloween bash also sunrise saloon is doing a halloween costume party with 406 which is going to be is as a country band and so yeah like i was saying uh mcat is doing our own halloween deal and it's going to be the missoula public library is hosting halloween under one roof which is a themed fun and candy for kids and families alike, MCAT will have their stop animation out front or in studio have spooky themed dance party. Um, Spectrum will be doing spooky science. This event is free and it will be doing a host of over 25 sponsored exhibits, spooky artists and crafts and fun science projects for all ages. Trick or treat in our tiny town and enjoy all the events our staff have to offer and of course there will be candy. 
And this all happens from uh, Sunday from 12 to 5 p.m. And also, the University of Montana is doing a Halloween choir, Spooktacular. What's better than one day of Halloween? Haunting a day early at the Halloween Chorale Spooktacular. And that's happening at the University of Montana at the Denison Theater. Uh, it's right next to the music building. You can't miss it. Monday, of course, is the actual Halloween date. And so here are some of the uh, series of events that are happening as well. Hitland Ga Garden Inn is doing a Missoula Fall Family Festival from 1 to 7 p.m. with an 8 p.m. dinner show for adults only. Uh, there would be something for everyone, including magic show um, and uh, face painting, art vendors, and stuff like that. So it's a $2 entry per person, $1 for carnival games. It's, yeah, it sounds pretty cheap, pretty good. And affordable food, nothing over $6. So, yeah, you get to enjoy all that stuff at the Hilton Garden Inn. Spooktacular Surrey at uh, Camby, Camby Tap House and Coffee, starting at 5 p.m. on Sunday, but with a twist. They're doing uh, a pie night for MEIC. Join us Halloween night for a chill gathering complete with a, a costume contest, raffle prizes, games, and table. Uh, Halloween burlesque show is going to be at the uh, Stave and Hook Speakeasy Halloween night. And Halloween with Joan Zen Band is going to be at uh, Union Club on Monday night. So all these things happening this weekend as well. A lot of spooky, spooky stuff. So that's it for me. I want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Um, Learn more about MCAT, go to MCAT.org, and you can enjoy all sorts of other episodes of Wake Up Missoula by finding me on my YouTube channel, Wake Up Missoula. But also, you can watch it here every Friday on Spectrum Charter 189 uh, every Friday. Um, if you miss in the morning, we always have a replay in the afternoon at 2. So thank you guys, and for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.